yet. Mm -hmm. We had the machine gun bunker. And London's boss, four cable north of Prince of Wales's. When we put this order to the Google Earth map, a very interesting result happened. According to the map, we are now here again. The first ship, the second ship, and the third ship address. The third shipment's address was Anzac Cove. Anzac Cove was not the wrong beach. It was mentioned in the plan, not with the name Anzac Cove as a location. Soldier from Western Australia would land over there. Why they would land on three different beaches? Because the covering forces goal was under the cover of darkness, go three different directions, clean the threats to enable a safer landing for the daylight landers. So men on the first ship would move down to find the guns that Gabbat had to destroy. Men on the second ship would go inland to find the other gun battery. Men on the third ship would land in Zakko, follow Arabo on the ridge line up to Chenak Bay, get the objective before Turks came. To be honest, being a local guide, I'm saying this from my heart, it was a perfect plan. We also checked the position where they want their men to land. But nothing happened as planned. The first problem they had on the morning of 23rd, weather was terrible. No landing could be done. The landing delayed to 25th of April. On April 25th morning, because moon position changed, instead of 90 minutes, they had only 45 minutes dark period. On that morning, something went wrong. Men on the first ship <coughs> landed to Anzac Cove. Men on the second ship landed to Anzac Cove. The ones who supposed to land, they landed just down here, where we are now. What went wrong? Since April 25 morning, 1915, we tried to find answer to this question. We have some theories. First theory, an unknown wind or current pushed the boats, they moved here. Second theory, British Navy left some market boys to sea to follow at night. Good idea. But the Turks saw them and moved them <laughs> to make Anzac Day in front of these bloody hills. And the third theory, no matter what the reason, bloody palms <laughs> send the Anzacs to the wrong beach. And the last theory, which is the lesser known one, but maybe the most accurate one. Have you heard of Charles W. Bean, official yeah. war correspondent of Anzac yeah. Army? Yeah. He spent all his time with the soldiers. Four years after the war, he came back Gallipoli, this time with the Turkish commanders, made another tour to learn other side. That made him a very knowledgeable man. Then he wrote official Australian history under 16 volumes. I didn't read all, but if you're interested, you can visit the website, the Australian War Memorial website. Online you can read all the documents. I have a copy of it. April 25, 1915. Some officers thought that the knoll of Areburnu was Gabatepe itself. <coughs> Noel Ariburnu, Noel Gabatepe. So, at night, the captain of this ship, instead of trying to follow this one, tried to follow that one. So the plan was go north of it. So they start to go north of it. Then they realized they got too close to the coast. They realized that, but they have no late. time to tolerate this. They have to make a decision. Go back, send the boys in the right positions in daylight where the Turkish cannons, or in the cover of darkness, bring the men to shore no matter where they are so probably that went wrong so they landed over here so what happened here then again we have a two different version of the story first version Turkish machine guns were covering all these hills and waiting for the Anzacs while they were landing here they were all easy targets that was a massacre thousands died on the beach please forget that story nothing happened here like this because there was not a strong Turkish army here because Turks never had expectation to have any landing over here. If you were a local, would you expect your enemy to land in front of these hill cliffs? No. But that was a small outpost. If you don't mind, now I take you in the, sh the sun to show you something. Please follow me. It's a bit sunny, but maybe with your hand cover, you can get some idea. On top of this hill, called Plax Plateau, Turks had a small outpost with 80 Turks, 8-0. These forces, now I can face this way to some bothers you. Come on, please turn this way. I don't want you to some bother you. On top of this hill, there was a small Turkish outpost with just 80 members. Number. And these troops were awakened this morning because just before the moon disappeared, while they're watching the horizon, on the left corner you can see islands. So they saw the ship's movements. 
and the Turkish Air Force commander called the headquarters and reported what he saw. So, I saw some of the ship's movements in the horizon. Okay, boy, don't panic and tell me how many of them were battleships, how many of them were transports. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's bloody dark, I can't tell. <laughs> that was the first and last talk. Then moon dissipated, there became a great silence, and then Turks start to wait. Because of cover of darkness, nothing was visible, but everything was hearable. And landing was a very noisy thing to do. Let me show you some photos. By the way, you happy in sun? Do you want to move shade? Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> These photos, all real photos taken during the landings. We don't photo the first wave because of darkness, but they did the same thing. What they did, from big ships, they passed a small transport down to the boats. Mm -hmm. Major first party did all of these things at night with the cover of darkness. How risky, how dangerous thing to do. When they get the boats, most people believe they roll their boats for a long time. It's not true because the boats link to each other and towed by the steamboats mm. to keep them together, mm. which was a very clever method or else boats will lose each other. But steamboats didn't have electrical engines making noise while the boats coming. So Turks were hearing this noise. When this noise increased, from hills to sea they start off on fire. The Anzacs had ordered not to use their guns when they were at the boat, to not shoot each other. Because the rifle flash also will show their position. I wish Turks were told the same thing. The fire of the Turks only showed location of Turk to the Anzac. But make the Anzacs very stressed. Because imagine you are first time in the battle, you're in a pack boat, while you're approaching, bullets whistle around you. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know how many Turks firing towards them. To this atmosphere later, sounds of machine guns also added. Not the Turkish machine guns, but the transport had some machine guns from hills to sea. Fire started, sea to hills, sorry. And fire in this atmosphere, hard to know who opened fire with gun or with machine gun. They were first among the fire boys, quite normal to report. We were well opposed by Turkish machine guns, but you can be sure there was no single machine gun here. After 15 minutes, Turks ran out of ammunition and they retreat. Then the Anzacs captured Turkish outpost. But on top of this, they had a big shock. Now, could you please one more time look back? You can say yeah, drop. Sir. From hills to left, there's a drop camps. Yeah. That was the biggest enemy of the Anzacs because they couldn't move to the left because that slope stopped them. So what they did, they went other side of the hill, went down in the hill, then they had to climb another, then another. If they could cross this edge, today we could talk a different story, because behind this hill, there's another ridge cross to Chenak Bar Hill. In one hour, they could take the hill's control. But moving down, make them lose two, three hours and give time for the Turks to win their troops. I will come back to your story later. Now, what's happening on the beach? Some photos I will show. Again, all real photos. This is the earliest picture. Distance of the ship to shore. Mm. From this distance, boats made the trips, carried them in. Mm. 6.30 in the morning. Australians with a Turkish prisoner walking in the coast. No dead bodies. Because in this 15 minutes fighting, they didn't lose many men on the beach. 8 a.m. 9.30 a.m. New Zealanders start to land now, until one New Zealanders would land. Kiwis didn't see any action on the beach, only first Australians saw some action. You don't see many people on the beach waiting, because we were landed sent up to the hills. 1 p.m. they stopped landing, because they tried to make a decide, decision whether call the boys back or continue landing. And I will use my fingers. We somewhere here now, North Beach, Anzac Cove. This is the second ridge, the firing line. This is third ridge, around four kilometer inland. Remember the white single memorial I showed? Mm -hmm. It's here. So these red dots are some of the furthest points reached by the Anzacs on the morning of the landing. Three, four hours after they land, they got these positions. But after Turkish attack started, Turks let the depart. Anzacs drawn back, and this line became the firing line. <coughs> And both sides rarely fought with each other and stopped each other. And both sides was heavy here, not down here. But during the fighting, the deaths or the winds moved backyards. So the Anzacs carried their deaths or winds to the beaches. But the problem, as they couldn't destroy the Turkish cannons, in daylight, Turkish cannons freely bombing the coast. Not to the beaches, but the coast. So they had to move the ships far away. And because they stopped landing for a couple of hours, no boat transportation, each wounded who brought to shore had to lay here and wait their turn for evacuation. 
after 5 p.m. when they restart landing, the newer landers experience was death and dying on the beach. Later they saw this atmosphere and report what they saw. Mm. Because of these reports we believe, we start to believe that was a blood that happened on the beach. Mm. But actually it was quite fine landing. Later, Enzaco, the other small beach, became a supply center. I'll show another photo now I'm finishing. Could you please turn this way? And last photo, there you are now. Fireplace behind the other bus, 180 years ago, it was like that. Vegetation was totally different than what it is. And today we use this area as a commemorative site for those who every year. Behind the Anzac sign, you have a chance to walk down the beach and touch the ground. After 10 minutes, photo break, we'll move to the next one. It's a diorama of the trenches. Yeah, yeah. These people do it's like a to brutal war, yeah. or a brutal battle, I should say. Here. We actually very close to your ship, Gary. But we have to take the long way again back. And the narrows of Dardanelle, where the castles and gun emplacements located. There were the mines, 400 piece of sea mines. That was the 11th mine line. Allied Navy unaware of these newly laid mines. <coughs> because before making a big attack, French and British ships used to coming in, doing some bombing, and they were turning back from here. It's very close to your harbor. And Turks decided to put another mine line, Hydley, and at night time with the help of a mine liar, which has a very dangerous and risky, risky trip, depart from Chinakkale at night, without touching the other mines, came down and put the 11th mine line here. As Ally didn't know this, 10 days later during the operation, while the ships were making manoeuvre, three ships hit the mines and sank there, and five of the others hit by Turkish artillery. Losing eight of 18 battleships here, make them just decide to retreat, because they know without taking someone from ground, they couldn't pass the Dardanelles and they withdraw. So that was the date, March 18. Then both sides start preparations for landing operation. And Turkish army, of course, expect landings will happen soon. But the problem, when or to where they will, there will be landings. Uh, to get a better support, to get the supplies quicker than normal, Turkish army's command left to the Germans. And the German generals came here and they didn't like the Turkish army's defense plan, which was based on the cost. Turkish commanders, uh, preferring to stay close on the coast, there are some possible landing beaches to protect the hills. But Germans found that very risky. Of course, they were right to think that because the naval bombardment would be very effective. If we'd be so close to the coast, we could lose all our troops before the operation started. So Turkish army divided into three sectors. According to Germans, the most urgent place we must defend was Bolaya. Where it is, we're now somewhere close to the bottom. Bolaya is top of peninsula. You can see a very tiny part, a very choppable part. 3.5 km wide, the peninsula is there, very tiny. Normally, the wideness of peninsula in average, where we are now, 10 km. And behind this hill called Suma Bay, from there to Dardanelle, it is 25 km wide, but behind these mountains, it's only 3 km. So, Turkish Army's German generals uh, expect most landing over there, so 34,000 troops located here. In total, they had 74,000. 20,000 of the Turks would be wait for landings on the other side of the Dardanelles in case any attack through Chinakale. 20,000 left in the hand. <coughs> now a smaller map. 20,000 men were two different divisions, 9th and 19th divisions. 9th division was given responsibility to defend, sorry, to observe the cost and report the movements to the inland headquarters. So 3,000 men will be observers of north sector, including where we are now. 3,000 will be at the southern tip, 3,000 in between to reinforce each other. Last 10,000 will be main armor reserves. They would locate in the village Bigale. So we are now here, from where we are now, 6 km inland. I tried to show you a hill, behind the hill, 10,000 Turks. So the army reserve will be located here. Plan, the meaning of this plan, if any attack happens in the south, Turkish troops will go to south. If to north, to north. So, like chess, see the movements, do the movements. But, German general forget to, uh, this detail. Alive would get idea about that defense and they could make another plan against this plan. 
Again, as the Turkish plan, the best plan would be land on many different places at the same time to confuse a Turk. You wouldn't want to be at the Turkish head Qatar this morning because from eight different places landing reports were coming on that morning. I'll come back to this story later. So part of this oper pre operations preparations continue. Anzac headquarters received the order which I read you from my mind. Again, one more time I'll read from the document. First Australian Division order for the landing, 18th of April 1915. The Australian and New Zealand Army Corps will land north of Gaba Tepe. The landing will probably be opposed. The landing will probably be opposed. <laughs> Imagine Anzac Jan's reaction. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> how many Turks, how many guns? Probably be opposed. The division will land between Gaba Tepe and Fisherman's Hut. Gaba Tepe, the knoll which I tried to show you again, will pass in front of it later, is there. Fisherman's Hut is, you see a small fishing boat tied in the bay, on the beach, it's somewhere over there. So Anzac would land between the two spots. To be honest, they landed later within the border. But the story board Anzac land on the wrong beach. Why? I will try to explain this topic to you, because uh, there is a big belief about Anzac's made a mistake during the landing. When Anzac generals <coughs> given this order, they didn't know anything about the area at the beginning. But later, they start to collect some data. Some of the officers wearing local fishermen clothes catch fish around the coast by calculating deepness of the water and getting some idea. One of the other Australian officers called Charles William Stewart, you can check his life story, he was Australian Army Air Force Intelligence Officer. The technology was not too bad. They didn't have modern F-16 planes, but they still had single engine planes which helped them reconnaissance and gave chance from top but underneath and this guy made a flight took hundreds of photos with the help of these photos prepare a map the original of this map is in war memorial in Canberra I have some a copy of it I will reflect what I see on the map to the ground my dear guys we are now somewhere by my finger <coughs> on this map on top of Gabata further down this way three guns four guns seven cannons facing this way one gun, seven gun battery, eight cannons facing this way. And he knows 20 tents where the museum. 20 tents means 200 Turks. From air, they could only count the tents. R average 10 men in per tent. And one kilometer inland, where the yellow memorial area, another 20 tents, another 200 Turks, not bad. This is corner of Dardanelle. 200 to 500 tents. Oh, some big army. 100 tents, 200 tents, 200 tents, 200 tents. They know where the big Turkish army camp. According to this map, Anzacs realized they had three big threats in front of them. First threat, guns at Gaba Tepe. Unless they were silenced, they couldn't do any safe landing. Second threat, at inland, 10 to 30,000 Turks waiting. <coughs> Sooner or later, they will come. Until they came, they need to bring as much as more men to show, but it would not be that easy, because they had a very big problem in front of them, the sea was very shallow. It's a perfect swimming beach, but a terrible landing beach because ships needed deeper waters. And none of the ships could come close to shore. It means they couldn't bring big parties to shore. So when they made a simple calculation, they realized in one hour they could bring 2,000. In three hours, they could bring 6,000 men to shore. But in three hours, Turks could bring 30,000. Under the circumstances, start landing in daylight would be too risky. So they decide to take another risk start land at night under the cover of darkness and the best night for the landing would be 23rd morning <coughs> because on that night moon will disappear early daylight will come late they will have 90 minutes cover of darkness yes at night Turks would not see they're coming but how they could see where they're going at night they didn't have night version binoculars or GPS's so they must follow a special tactic and they did firstly they decide to send third brigade to shore the 3rd Brigade of Australian Army was a covering force, was a mixture unit. There were men from 9th Battalion from Queensland, 10th Battalion from South Australia, 11th from Western Australia, 12th mix, there were some Tasmanians as well. They put, they used three ships for the first landing, called Queens, Prince of Wales, London. Mm -hmm. Queenslanders would be on the ship Queens, South Australia had Prince of Wales, Western Australia had the ship London. And I have the operation order of these three ships with me. Queens both land on beach about one mile north of Gaba Tepe. Remember the A point, the first gap. Prince of Wales bought four cable 800 yards north of Queens. 
this uh, battlefield has a lot of unknown soldiers. A lot of the uh, bones were mixed here. After they have a bombardment, which destroyed all Turkish positions, which also bury all the Turkish positions, Turks normally having timbers to protect themselves from coming Anzac hand grenades. Anzacs use the advantage of playing cricket a lot here because the grain sent by the Turks immediately comes back and more fastly. So Turks later understood they use the cricket stuff to send the grenades. They play cricket with the hand grenades here beautifully. So they used to have timbers to protect these trenches, but during the bombardment, that trenches were well buried. And this time that timbers locked them inside their trenches. Mm -hmm. The survivors later report Turks tried to make a shelter trench for themselves, but they didn't know they made graves for themselves. At 5.30 p.m. the Anzacs attack started and they passed the Norman ring. Now between the first and second French line, you know what over to the country area, the most fierce fighting of the campaign starts. The main rule again was in charge, to stay alive kill your enemy and they kill each other with whatever they found man to man, bayonet to bayonet, hand grenade to hand grenade in four days fighting around 6,000 people lost their life the majority of their exact death time also not known so in many of the headstones here you will see two dates in the headstones 6 slash 10 to 4, 7 slash 12 to 4 no doubt, Anzacs won this battle they managed to take control of all this cemetery ground area. Normally when you want something, it must make you happy. But at the battles, there are no winners. This photo I will come close to you, taken by the Anzacs as the people captured Turkish Trench. Look at their face, look at the expression. You can't read any sign of happiness in their face. Although they won this battle, they so upset. Sometimes I am showing this photo before I tell the stories and ask my guesses. Could, could you please guess to whom this photo belongs? To the winners of a battle or a loser? The common answer was losers because they were very sad. I'm saying there was a huge drama here, even winners were losers. And also this photo gives us idea about how deep the trench at the time. We haven't seen any trench yet, but as our drive to Turkish Memorial, on the right and left hand side, and the trees, but back then they were deeper than what it is.